A very good evening to you and thank you for staying with Metropole Debrief. We've already broken down the numbers and when we sit down, dear viewer, it's time for the conversation. Joining me for this conversation is Dr. James Nyoro, who's the Deputy Governor of Kiambu County, among an impeccable and sterling record on food security and nutrition security, both locally and internationally. Thank you very much, Dr. Ari, for making time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank As I was it. going through the numbers, and I had mentioned earlier, the government allocated around 59 billion to agriculture. Now, if we track back to the Malabo Agreement, it was agreed that African leaders will try and set aside at least 10% of their national budget to agriculture. What we set aside is barely even 5%. Let's talk about that. Let's, let's use that as the basis for this conversation in relation to the government's vision towards achieving food security. Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, it's true, uh, a couple of years back, I think it's two, three years ago, uh, there was a conference that was hosted by the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, and the analysis was showing that there was a coordination, mm -hmm. there was a relationship between the countries that had allocated uh, a substantial amount of money to agriculture and agriculture productivity and food security. Mm -hmm. That was very, very clear. Mm -hmm. Out of the countries that have been, uh, for, in for instance, you know, you don't have to go far, uh, Rwanda, mm -hmm. um, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. uh, countries such as Mozambique, mm -hmm. those countries that had allocated a substantial amount of resources into agriculture mm -hmm. have seen an enhancement of food security and they are producing more and they are selling more. Mm -hmm. uh, the converse is also true. And we are talking about, about uh, a meeting that took place last year. Uh, um, Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa normally hold an annual uh, meeting, meeting called AGRF that brings together all the stakeholders. And that's why they break down those figures. Mm -hmm. This year, in the next two months, it's going to be in Accra, Ghana. Again, they'll be looking at the countries that have been able to uh, put more resources into agriculture and what has happened in terms of food security, what has happened in terms of income, okay. and what has happened in terms of employment. So it is true. But um, let me put uh, uh, a, a, a crema uh, somewhere mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, Kenyan situation is a bit tricky. Why is it? So you, you, ca you it cannot tricky? you cannot necessarily look at those figures and say, you know, so we haven't put ten percent mm -hmm. in two in two ways. Okay. The first one is you know Kenyan agriculture is devolved. Mm -hmm. So Kenyan agriculture is in the hands of the county uh, governments, mm -hmm. and therefore you cannot expect the national government to allocate ten percent of what otherwise another government that is not devolved would allocate. What you need to do is to see how much has been allocated by the counties mm -hmm. and then add to the allocation that is done at the national level. So that is one. And I have, I have, I have a caveat on that, that despite that, mm -hmm. even the allocation of agriculture by the counties has been minimal. Mm -hmm. So notwithstanding that uh, there is devolution, the counties have given agriculture very, very, very minimal allocation from the resources that they have gotten. The second one, the second uh, consideration, which is unlike other African countries, which is Kenyan, is that when you talk about investment in agriculture, mm -hmm. you need to consider that our agriculture is largely in the private sector. Okay. Okay. So there is a component of investment that comes from the private sector. Mm -hmm. If you look at, uh, you know, seeds, there are so many seed uh, uh, companies that are producing that technology. So whereas I agree with you and I say there is that positive correlation, mm -hmm. it, it, it would also be misleading to look at Kenya and compare it with others. So mm -hmm. if we are looking for the cost of us not getting to the food security goals, that's not the one. Then what are some of the causes? <laughs> because we have arable land. We have more arable land than other countries that are doing better than us. We have the resources. We have the manpower. Where is the discord? Okay. It's good to... Uh, because this is a discussion that has been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to look at what has been happening in Kenya uh, over the last 20 or so years. To a large extent, Kenya was very, very self-sufficient. Self-sufficient means you can produce your own. 
it may not be in the you know in in the best interest of becoming self-sufficient. But uh, to the beginning to the mid of nineties, mm -hmm. Kenya was producing enough of its of, of, of its food. You know, just across the board, maize, wheat, rice. You know, we were producing enough. Mm -hmm. But from the nineties, and if you remember, mid nineties is when the whole market reform started to come in. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a lot of grammar that government should not be involved in government, in, in business, and therefore government needs to pull out and make the condition conducive for private sector to come in. And we played a big role. I was then a research uh, person at Tagameo Institute mm -hmm. of Vegetarian University, and we did a lot of work uh, trying to convince government to ensure that the private sector takes up the productive uh, roles and then the government retreats to make conditions that are conducive for agriculture. Mm -hmm. So during that period, that is when we started losing this. Mm -hmm. Because what happened, our population was still growing. Our production has stagnated. So we started to see a deficit building where the consumption was just starting to get higher mm -hmm. than the production. Like for instance, for the sake of May, for the case of maize, for the case of wheat, for the case of rice, we started to see that gap coming in. Now, at that point, any rational government should have come in and halted the trend and said, no, we cannot allow that gap to go. Mm -hmm. But instead, what happened was that the government did not actually agree mm -hmm. to pull out of agricultural production. Today, Kenya is probably the only country in the world that has a million and one parasitos that are parasitic. You have the National Cereals and Produce Board, whose role you do not even know. Now, at the mid-90s and coming to the beginning of the 20s, that is when those organizations should have been shifted. Because prior to that, those organizations were helping farmers. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, maize farmers will tell you that there was a, a time when they would go to AFC, Agricultural Finance Corporation, and they would get a loan. Mm -hmm. They would get a loan, and they would go to um, um, KFC, uh, KFA and they would get inputs. The, the money given as a loan from AFC would be sent to uh, uh, KFA to pay for the goods. And when the maize is ready, it would be sold to NCPB, who would pay KFA, who would pay AFC, and the farmer would be ready so to it do was it. A so institutions cycle. at that point were working. And then the government thought that they can still may continue to make them work, even when the rest of the world had moved. Mm -hmm. So there was one thing that we want to talk about that has been characteristic of this, is lack of political goodwill. Speaking by of political subsequent, goodwill. By subsequent governments, mm -hmm. from the 90s up to today, mm -hmm. you do not see very clear political goodwill in saying we are going to tackle the problem of food insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, they have, you know, I have worked in countries across the, across the region. In 1994, in 1984, the world sang, we are the world. Mm -hmm. We had the biggest drought in Ethiopia. You know, many children died. Yeah. Ethiopia was, you know, everybody knows about that famine. And subsequent to that, after that, uh, Prime Minister, the late Prime Minister Maris came in and told Ethiopians never again shall we be fed by the world. Today, Ethiopia is feeding Kenya. The same as you said in Tanzania. So it is the, the, that lack of political goodwill. And we can, we can actually unpack that and say what is political goodwill that the Kenya government has lacked so that we are in a situation where in two subsequent years we are importing maize from Mexico. Mm -hmm. We can unpack it and see what it is. Great stuff. Political goodwill. The president came up with the big four agenda, said under one pillar there will be food security. And uh, it's been broken down, 700,000 acres under um, irrigation, arable land. They say we'll work on value addition, increase the farmer's income. What are some of the things in this pillar that they've gotten right that goes to speak to political goodwill? And what are some of the things that we can nip and tuck to ensure we are food secure? I think one of the things that I want to, I want to uh, uh, discuss and say is that it, it's not lack of good documents mm -hmm. in Kenya. Uh, that has resulted into the situation that we are in. What is because it? what you are telling me now is a good document. Because you are talking about the ASDA, ASDGS, the Agricultural Sector Transformation Strategy. Mm -hmm. we, we, prior to that, there was ASDSP, Agriculture Sector uh, Development Strategic, whatever. Mm -hmm. Before that, there was... Uh, the, loads and loads of other documents. It, it, is not, it is not lack... Remember, 
we have Vision 2030, which is the overall riding strategy that has put agriculture at the center of uh, uh, d d d d d to be able to drive our GDP be driven by agriculture GDP. Mm -hmm. It is all stipulated within the vision. So, so it's what not do we need to do? Of, it's not what do we need to do? That's the thing. It's not lack of documents. It's not lack of those strategies. Mm -hmm. It is actually implementing in single 10% of the strategy that has been enumerated. It is that is where political goodwill comes in. Political goodwill do not come in if you develop some of the biggest and largest and poor, you know, uh, nicest documents. It is that document that you take and say three of these things are going to be implemented all through. That's the political goodwill that we are talking about. What are some of the key things that the president can pick on and say before 2022 I will ensure I have implemented A, B, C. So by 2022 at least a certain percentage of Kenyans are food secure. Okay. Uh, let's pause. Um, many studies done, and one that was done by Tegemeo Institute mm -hmm. way back, a couple of years back, showed one figure that has been that should be the center of any plan for any government on food and nutrition strategy. Mm -hmm. That that study showed that 52 percent mm -hmm. of the so-called farmers buy more from the market than they sell. That is a very, very important strategic mm -hmm. uh, statistic. Mm -hmm. So here you have a farmer in Siaya who produces two bags. That yeah. is called a farmer. Mm -hmm. That farmer produces two bags. After the harvest of those two bags, the farmer wants to be paid 3,000 shillings per bag. Throughout the year, this farmer in Siaya will buy 28 bags from the market. Sounds like voodoo economics. Now, they'll buy 28 bags from the market. So if they were clamoring to get 3,000 shillings when they were selling two bags, they will then be buying at 3,500 shillings for 28 bags. In essence, that statistic was very, very important. What mm -hmm. it was telling us are two things. Mm -hmm. It was telling us that first, our small-scale farmers will not be able to feed themselves and feed us in the cities and feed the people who are in arid and semi-arid areas. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we needed to think seriously as a country about moving to large-scale food production. Mm -hmm. Because by the time this farmer is a zero-sum game, where they are producing the same as they are consuming or they are buying the same as they are selling, by the time that that farmer gets there, it's a long time. Mm -hmm. So they will, they will not have produced meat for the people living in urban centers in Kibera. Mm -hmm. So it showed us that we needed to think about large-scale production so that as farmers become self-sufficient, there is somebody producing for the urban scale, mm -hmm. uh, for, for the urban area. And hence, that was the origin of the, the whole thinking about Garana Kuraru, about Pekera, about Mwea, about that we have to come in and do large scale so that the gap, the gap in means is about 15 million bucks every year. Mm -hmm. That gap you can very quickly reduce it if you go large scale. So that is what, what that statistic told us. Mm -hmm. The second thing that statistic told us is that our food price is very high. Mm -hmm. If you compare our food price with the food, uh, the maize coming from Tanzania or yeah. coming from Uganda and now coming from Ethiopia, ours is still very high. Mm -hmm. And being very high, farmers are wanting to be compensated by asking for high price. Okay. When they're asking for high price, consumers will have to pay very high price. Mm -hmm. So the solution to that, and I say that is one statistic that tells you a lot. The solution to that is we need to increase our productivity. Okay. So if you have an acre and you are only getting two bags if you are in Siaya, you can do things that you get 30 bags if you are a farmer in Siaya which you are not doing. And we have now started to look at what are those things that you can be able to do. What are because, some of of the low, because of the low yields, the farmer in uh, Wasingishu, if you, if you go to Wasingishu, mm -hmm. um, the farmer there is probably getting 20 bucks mm -hmm. in an acre. That is because the quality of seed is not good. Mm -hmm. The actual technology, seed technology that the farmer is using is not specific to that particular area. Mm -hmm. They are probably using technologies that could have been 
in Bugoma, mm -hmm. and the Bugoma farmer is using the technology that could have been in Wasingishu. Mm -hmm. So appropriating technologies, getting the right technologies, getting the seed quality, so that you don't have people who are selling commercial seed as, 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 as a seed, commercial maize as seed. So we, 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 we've looked at that. We looked at extension. And that you was know, my next and, point. And, and, and you know, let, let, me, let, me, let me just tell you about the technology because it's very interesting. We have a project that we are doing right now mm -hmm. in, in, in Kiambu um, and, and we'll be extending it to other counties where we have now started to appropriate the technology to the right agroecological zone. Okay. okay? And I, I always give an analogy uh, about Coca-Cola. Um, agriculture technologies are not like Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, if you go to any village, you get a Coca-Cola, the same bottle, the same shape, the same color, the same taste. Okay? Now, agricultural technologies are so specific that if you are planting maize here, by the time you get to the river, that will be a different variety. By the time mm -hmm. you get to Bachacos, that will be a different variety. So appropriating that and making sure that what you are taking to the stockist in the river and whatever is the one that is right for that place is one thing that you need to do. Then, extension. Extension is dead. Yeah. Extension died in the hands of national government. However, Before there's the devolution 2010. right now. No, no, so no, no, let me, let me, let me come to that. Let me come to that. You know, if it died in the hands of national government, then what they did was they transferred a dead body to the counties. What are the counties now, need to do? Now, extension had been dead before devolution was done. And, and therefore, what the counties did was they inherited a, a labor force mm -hmm. that was, did not know exactly what they want to do. They were not facilitated to move. They, they don't have vehicles. They don't have... So that's what the counties have uh, inherited. And fortunately, they don't know what they have inherited because they have not tried to understand. There's only a few, a few counties that have tried to understand mm -hmm. the whole aspect about uh, extension. But now, let, let me come to this because it's important. Mm -hmm. the, the, my, my, my example of Coca-Cola, you can have the right technology, the maize seed and the fertilizer and what. That is like having a Coca-Cola bottle but you don't know how to open it. It okay. will not help you. So what we are thinking about, and everybody is now trying to see, okay. is how can we have other innovative models mm -hmm. of ex uh, having extension so that the farmer is able to know the space between the two plants and the space between the, uh, the, the, the two rows and, and, and two plants. So th th those are areas that we need to do. Uh, I don't have to be very micro okay. so that pe we don't lose people. All we are saying is for Kenya, to come out of the quagmire that we are in. Mm -hmm. It is not just a shortage of, techno of uh, uh, documents and strategies and agriculture being one of the big four. So what? Okay, let's try and do the big small out of that one big four. Mm -hmm. It is actually translating that into an actionable plan and following it all through. And that is, if you want, I can give you an example of what happened to Ethiopia. That's exactly what has caused Ethiopia to transform its agriculture sector. Honorable, hold on to that thought. Speaking of finding an actionable plan and following it through, the government began the Kulalu scheme at the coast region of the country. And it's been trying to follow it through. And our very own Victoria Amonga was there and she was following up on that story. And we want to listen in to what CSQ and Jury had to say about Gulana Kulalu, the irrigation scheme and... Um, the, the future prospects of the project. Listen in. Finding modern solutions to modern day problems. Your two cents. You know, um, as I said, I was involved. Remember, I was a food security advisor to the president for one and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, and the thinking from that figure of 52%, the thinking of moving towards large scale farming, obviously, is because we cannot be able to be fed by our small scale farmers. Mm -hmm. Although they are still important, they have to continue improving their productivity. 
but then, and therefore moving to large scale. And that was one of the basis of moving to Garana Kuraru. It's large scale, it is a million acres, we were to do have a million acres of, uh, of maize, mm -hmm. and you know, we would, we would they would do two seasons because of the rain, uh, the, 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 the irrigation, they would do two seasons, you don't do normally two seasons. So that was to be it. Two, because of climate change, and the incidences of a bad, a bad year, the, a, a, a drought mm -hmm. is so high. One in every five years is going to be a drought year. One in every five years is going to be a flood year. And therefore, starting to think about in, during the flood year, we need to capture the water. Okay. Okay, put it in a dam. That is what happens all over the world. As one high dam. I mean, we don't have to go far from here as you're going to Ethiopia, to, 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 to Egypt. As one high dam. Water comes through River Nile. It is captured when River Nile is flooding. And then they close the gates. And then they use it for large scale uh, you know, irrigation. So I agree entirely that the principle for Garana Kuraru was large scale, but irrigate. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you. What the minister is not telling you is that project, there is no dam. By the time the river gets to Garana, because the the area is called Garana. Mm -hmm. There is only just about 25% of the water remaining on the river. So you see, you see, the river comes from Mukambani. It goes down. By the time it gets to Garana, because Garana is 100 kilometers to Malindi. Mm -hmm. So it, it's ki kind of a started meandering. So the, the potential of the river is only about 25%. The, the water in the river is about 25%. So it's yes. like a canal now, in the wind. Now, look, you... You, you, you cannot naturally withdraw the 25%. You need to withdraw and leave 10% to proceed to the, to the Indian Ocean because there is life along the river. Mm -hmm. So that 15% could only do a maximum of 10,000 acres. And therefore, it was only prudent that for Garana Kuraru to succeed, you do a dam upstream that would store water during the rainy season, water that would be discharged so that you can do the many large scale that you are talking has about. Has that been done? That, was, that has, been, has not been you done. You advised it to the president for one yes, and a half years. Yes, yes, and we said it. Probably you don't know why I left. And we said it that by the time you go for election in 2017, mm -hmm. you will not have produced more than 10,000 uh, acres because you needed to do a dam upstream. That was uh, our was, was advisor in, in 2014. Mm -hmm. And I said it very clearly, if you want, you know, I said it very clearly, for you to do this, we are in October 2014, you probably require two years to put up the dam. Okay? So your dam will be complete in November of 2016. But when the dam is complete, there's no rain. You have to wait for the rains of 2017 to fill the dam so that you plant in Ju June, July of 2017. Mm -hmm. But August was the second uh, Tuesday of 2018. So would you sit back and wait for that kind of disaster to happen? So it is the plants that you put, before you get to the pictures, the good pictures that we are, we are seeing there, it is the plant that you put as I said, you have a strategy. Just unpack it and say, uh, stage number one, we have a dam upstream. How much does it cost? How long will it take to put? And we, we've now talked about many dams after that. Mm -hmm. Many. Yeah. And a lot of land, Yes, yes. You know, they're very... A, a lot of those. We've talked about many dams. But the point I'm making here is that Garana Kuraru could be producing maize today if we had a dam that was put upstream with the rains, not these ones, prob probably last year's rain, mm -hmm. it would have been full, and now you'll be discharging water as you require it to irrigate. So what you're saying is that it's a good project short term, but it's not sustainable the implementation, long term. The implementation falls short of an implementation of a plan, of a program, like running this, this TV station. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to bring the people into the conversation because at the end of the day, when we sure. talk about numbers of 2 million, it's the people on the ground. We start with one tweet here from Owen Kilgora who says, in 2014, Food and Agriculture Organization declared that Tanzania had achieved self-efficiency with 1.6 million tons of maize and 800,000 tons of rice surpluses. What are they doing different that Kenya is not doing? As I said, uh, incidentally, when, um, when I left uh, and I joined uh, uh, Gates Foundation mm -hmm. and I ad was ad advising Gates Foundation for one and a half years until 2016, 
uh, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Nigeria, uh, Mozambique, and Burkina Faso are the countries that I was, I was, I was looking at. Mm -hmm. So I knew very well that what was happening in Tanzania. What and was this, happening? This, was, this started with Kikwete, with what they call Kirimokwanza. Okay, so they had a strategy. In fact, the strategy was like ours, agricultural sector development strategy. And what they did was they established a presidential delivery unit called PDU, mm -hmm. presidential delivery unit, under the office of the president, hang on, under the president, under the office of the president, and PDU was supposed to do four things. Mm -hmm. One is to ensure that there is enough resources for doing agriculture. So the budget that was allocated to agriculture through PDU, they have regional, they have regions like the old, our old provinces, mm -hmm. but the money passes through the, the national government. But the money passing through PDU uh, was, was made available. The second thing was that the Prime Minister Kikwete then was the one who was chairing the inter-ministerial coordination team in agriculture. Let me tell you, and I will not hide you, agriculture will never, never succeed if the other ministries are not supporting it. Mm -hmm. Agriculture will require roads to move the produce from uh, where it is to the market. It saves a lot it of wastage in between. Agriculture will require Ministry of Finance to provide funds for all these kind of things. Agriculture will require Ministry of Energy to provide electricity to do the kind of things that we are seeing in, in, in Garana Kuraru. It requires the Ministry of Land because you have to do, it requires the Ministry of Environment. Now, if you don't coordinate and you don't have an intergovernmental coordination for that, you will be as the Ministry of Agriculture, like, you know, uh, uh, C.S. Kionjori, you see he's around there. If it was through PDU, he would have been with the C.S. Environment, P, uh, CS roads mm -hmm. and whatever. So that in a ministerial co coordination is what uh, you, they got in PDU. The that thing that they did was transparency and accountability. You have been given resources. Give us your milestone. Within the next six months, what mm -hmm. will you have achieved? And you tell us what you have achieved. Mm -hmm. Within six months, you come back and show us mm -hmm. what you have done. Now, that is called holding the people that you have given resources, that you are coordinating, hold them accountable. Now, this is what we don't have here. Mm -hmm. We still have a Ministry of Agriculture that is running around. In fact, we have a bigger problem. We have a bigger problem. What is the problem? Because agriculture is also devolved. And the national government cannot now uh, run agriculture alone. So, therefore, you need an inter- governmental coordination mm -hmm. between the national government and the county government through the, the, council, the council of governors. Mm -hmm. Now, that has not been working and you've had all the noise, uh, governors making noise that uh, we have this regulation about uh, you know, this and the, that regulation about coffee, we don't agree with this. So, ev everybody is trying to push or pull on your side. We cannot. So, that is what happened to Tanzania. Mm -hmm. It's what uh, the same story is what happened to Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, it was supposed to happen to Nigeria. There was change of power in Nigeria. Yeah. And uh, Nigeria is still struggling like us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well put. It's it's it goes beyond the papers. It's political goodwill. It's the leader you put in office. It's the people who have the resources. They must be held to account. And besides being held to account, they must be responsible with the responsibility that they have been given. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, interesting conversation we're having with Dr. Nyoro here on food security. We want to take a very short breather. But when we come back, this was just the beginning of bringing your voice into this conversation. When we come back on the other side of the break, my voice goes off and yours comes on on social watch. If you haven't been talking to us, hashtag Metropole Day brief at Andy Road Ganga at Metropole TV KE chime into that conversation and let us know what you think of food security in the country so far and if we can achieve food security or it was just another re-election campaign that was beautifully put on paper. See you shortly.